Today's speaker is um, Dr. Anthony Williams. Um, Dr. Williams got his honorary BS from the University of Liverpool in 1985. And three years later, he received his PhD from the University of London. He took a postdoctoral position at the National Research Council in Ottawa, Canada. And he was an NMR facilities manager at the University of Ottawa. He then um, worked for five years for Eastern Kodak Company in Rochester as the NMR technology leader. And then he joined the Advanced Chemistry Development Labs, ACD Labs, as their senior project manager, um, where he developed software tools for the um, prediction of NMR spectra and other analytical processes. Um, after 10 years at ACD Labs, he um, uh, took on consulting positions for a number of pharmaceutical and cheminformatics company. And then during this time, he started to develop, well, he was a lead um, developer for the ChemSpider portal. And in 2009, um, the ChemSpider was um, acquired by the Royal Society of Chemistry. And um, Dr. Williams took on the position of Vice President of Strategic Development for the ChemSpider. Um, I can also say that um, Dr. Williams is one of the most adapt people at given presentations that I've ever known. Um, I believe it was at the 2009 um, ACS meeting, the one that was in um, Salt Lake City. Um, the day before his presentation, he went up to do some skiing. It was either at Snow Bowl or Ultima, I'm not sure which. And he got snowed in. And uh, his presentation came on, and he managed to find a corner of the ski lodge where he could take out his laptop and gave his presentation um, ad hoc through the uh, ski lodge. Is that not correct? Uh, it's a slightly different story. I went up the morning of my presentation with uh, a colleague to drop his son off. And while we were dropping his son off, the snow came in behind us, and I got stuck on the hill in a suit and tie. And I had to give it from a, from a lodge. And uh, I gave my first presentation from the lodge via WebEx and Skype. And two hours later, we were off the hill, and I gave my second one in the same room face-to-face. -face. So. Okay. Well, with that, I'm going to introduce <laughs> um, Dr. Tony Williams. Thank you. Well, I, I may look like I'm speaking from a dark hole somewhere in, uh, uh, in the world. I'm in North Carolina, actually. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me. If you can, if you can hear me in the back, please raise your hand. Excellent, but beautiful. Okay, so uh, thanks for showing up. I will uh, do my best to keep this uh, light-hearted and entertaining um, because uh, trying to give presentations from afar is, is hard and I believe trying to listen to them is pretty difficult when somebody's not in the room. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is light-hearted and entertaining because of the nature of what it is, trying to navigate an internet full of chemistry. Uh, but it's also extremely important and will become increasingly important as the, as the Internet just continues to dominate as a data source and provider for us. So I'm sure all of you use the Internet uh, every day to research something that's related to your work. Uh, certainly you're all using it in the evenings, you're all probably looking at maps, you know, that just the internet is everywhere for us. But when you're looking for chemistry, you're either looking at PDF files online or you're trying to find chemicals to purchase or you're looking at information on Wikipedia, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of chemistry information online. The question is what's there and is it of any value? What's the quality? Uh, certainly there are numerous representative flavors. I will, I will give you some examples of that uh, just, just in case you're not aware of them. Uh, I will show you how the internet can actually be searched today by chemical structure. So it is possible today to draw a chemical structure and search the web for that chemical. I'll show you some ways we've been working on that. I will discuss the quality on the internet because, of course, everything they say about Britney Spears is true, and in the same way, everything they say about a chemical is true, as well we know. Uh, and I'm also going to challenge us that we're all participants in the internet today, and we shouldn't all just be users. We can all contribute, and we've been building a system that allows you to contribute to the chemistry internet. And I'm going to show you how to do that and encourage you to participate. At the end, uh, I will give a live demo of the ChemSpider uh, platform that we've been building. And uh, you know, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation, but also questions and answers on the live demo. And we can, we can show you how to answer particular questions as you ask them. So this is a short list of where chemistry is online. Uh, my judgment is, is that everybody is using Wikipedia today uh, at some, in some way or another. 
Uh, it's possible that you don't believe everything that's on Wikipedia, but I would actually say that for chemical compounds now on Wikipedia, uh, the quality of what's up there is, is excellent. Uh, there's been a dedicated team of about six people working on it for three and a half years, and what is there is just continues to improve in quality, but it's, it's very, very good at present. There's chemical vendor databases, there's metabolic pathway databases, properties, patents, drug discovery data, pub certainly publications, because the publishers are rolling out uh, their, their content through the, through the internet, compound aggregators, and ChemSpider is one of those. And we have blogs and wikis and open notebook science and, and, and. There's all, so much information on chemistry online. So these are some of the representative flavors of chemistry. Uh, whether you know it or not, that chemical at the top uh, actually has this particular Cas number, it has this uh, trivial name, it has this systematic name, it has this smile string, and for those of you who were, who were here last week for David Wilde's presentation, you'll recognize what smiles is. I will review it slightly today. Here we have an inchy string. I will tell you in detail what the inchy is a little later and how it's important to inter interlinking the web. And this is an inchy key, and I will tell you about that. All of these are the same chemical. It's just that this is how we like to think of things if we're chemists. This is our unique language. It means nothing to anyone else who's not a chemist. They're all representative flavors. You will find all of those on the web. If you copied and pasted any of these particular strings in Google, you would find a response. Uh, we heard a little bit from David Wilde last week about mole files, uh, just a very short reflection. Uh, these particular types of depictions of chemical structures are, de are showing uh, atoms and bonds connected. The bonds have order, so this is a single bond, this is a double bond. These are rings, uh, these are single, single bonds out to a, a methyl group, for example. These are commonly drawn in flat form. They are called 2D mole files, so they have XY coordinates only on the page, but they can also contain... Uh, 3D geometry, so they can also be X, Y, Z geometry. Uh, this is what a mole file looks like under the hood, and it's a set of coordinates as well as connectivities. This carbon is attached to this carbon. It also has a proton attached over here that's not shown. It's also attached here. And what these do is they represent the connectivity of the molecule. They are the really the industry standard for interchanging chemical structures between drawing packages. So many of you probably use ChemDraw, some of you use ChemSketch, maybe some of you use Marvin Draw. There's, a, there's an abundance of these drawing structures, uh, drawing packages online today. Some of them Java applets that can't be used on iPads, some of them JavaScript editors that can be used on iPads and iPhones. There's many, many ways, many tools to draw structures, but they all interchange in this multi file format. They also all have their own binary file formats, as well as a whole series of others that are historical formats. But mole file is the most common one. And this is uh, showing you a little more about uh, what the detailed mole file will look like. If you want to know more detail about mole files, take a look on Wikipedia. As usual, there is a good article there. Uh, Smiles is a format that is a, a linear string of characters. And here is an example shown right here. Hopefully you can see it. I will show some more shortly. And it represents how um, fragments of the molecule are pieced together. There are no coordinates involved. So if, if I passed you this particular string of characters, even though it does represent the molecule, what you would have to do is you would have to push that through a converter that would turn that molecule into a set of connections then you would actually have to use a layout algorithm that then, if you like, expands that molecule into a form that is uh, visually, um, uh, visually interpretive for us, so it's aesthetically improved. Uh, many complex molecules, when you initially convert them from, from a smile string into a connection table, can be particularly ugly. And these, it's these layout packages that have to improve the way they look. Smiles is very useful. Um, it has had a lot of um, contributions to the chem informatics world, specifically for uh, substructure searching, speed of searching. Uh, it 
it's still very, very important, but there is also another uh, package that's come along and supports which is similar in nature. Uh, just to show you, smiles can, can encapsulate uh, stereochemistry, and here's just a very simple way inside the, the text string that shows you how that happens. And here are these two ampersands here indicating this particular stereochemistry. The one ampersand here shows you the reverse stereochemistry. Uh, very complex molecules have very complex smile strings, but you can actually uh, go through them and interpret them and convert them back to structures if you have the right skill set. Uh, they also distinguish tautomers. So here we have uh, the same molecule, but in a different tautomeric form. And you can see that these smile strings uh, are, are different. There are canonicalizers that will actually collapse these uh, smile strings and um, can make them equivalent in, in various, various ways. Canonicalizers, however, are dependent on the actual producer of the software package. So because there are numerous software packages, numerous smiles converters, smiles will actually differ from vendor to vendor, and the canonicalizer itself will differ from vendor to vendor. As a result, the same molecule in the hands of various uh, database providers or chemical software providers, the same molecule will be represented by a different smile string. That's a, that's a significant problem. Because now if you have one database built on one cheminformatics provider containing smile strings and another built on smile strings built by a different vendor, the same molecules cannot connect together because the smile strings are different even when canonicalized. And here's an example. These are vendor-dependent smiles for one particular molecule. This is ACD Labs. This is OpenEye, and this is one of the database. Uh, one of the databases called Kemble, uh, which is hosted by the European Bioinformatics Institute. This is off of their database. These are actually all meant to be the same molecule, but they are. Uh, they are. Mm, these, I believe, no, even these are different. These are very similar, the Kemble and AC Labs, but they do differ. CC1 here, CC2 here. So they, there's no way to match between them using smiles. To connect. Uh, this is lifted directly from Wikipedia. Um, this is about the International Chemical Identifier. The project has been around for about a decade at this point. It was a, developed originally by UPAC, International Union of Pure Applied Chemistry, and NIST in Washington. Uh, it was developed as open source code, so you can actually down, download the code, but it is managed by one particular group made available as a set of libraries that anybody can use and integrate into their software package. The, the benefit to this is that because it's one, uh, one source code, one bundle of code that is uh, circulated across the entire community, everybody is using the same ways to generate strings. In this case, we have ethanol, and here is the inchi that is generated. Here is ascorbic acid ascorbic acid, and here's the inchi string for that. As long as everybody is using the same version of code, all cheminformatics vendors will produce the same inchies, um, all databases will contain the same inchies, and everything can start to connect up. There are a couple of caveats, but I will, I will outline them. So, inchi's got a single code base, as I said, no variability, as with smiles. Inchi strings can also be reversed to structures, but you've got the same problem as with smiles. When you take that string, that inchi string, and you push it through the code, it converts it back to a connection table, a mol file, if you like, and then it has to be laid out again. You have to get the, the, the orientations correct, the angles correct, so that it's aesthetically pleasing. But it has been adopted very well by the community, and many databases now Dozens and dozens of databases have inchies. Uh, people writing blogs are inserting inchies. Wikipedia has inchies. And as a result, the internet is getting connected together by these inchie strings. And it's, it's a layered approach. And as a result, there are some very interesting things you can do with it. And I will show you some of the advantages that we've taken uh, into ChemSpider. What we have initially is the molecular formula then you have the connectivity, and that's called the main layer. And what it does is it displays for you, if you like, the molecule and encapsulates all of the connectivities, but it doesn't isolate the charge, it doesn't take care of the isotopes, and it doesn't deal with the stereochemistry. 
it's just the connectivities. Then you have the charge layer, telling you whether the molecule is charged. You have a stereochemical layer. You have an isotopic layer. And you have what they call fixed uh, proton layer. So for tautomers, for example, if you add a fixed proton layer, you are defining specifically where the, where the protons are, where the hydrogen atoms are on the molecule, and you define a tautomer. So you can distinguish multiple tautomers with different inches. On the flip side, if you choose not to set the protons, then a whole series of tautomers will collapse under the same inchy, which is a very, very powerful way of, um, of, of collapsing data together. Here's the example. If you've got mobile uh, proton perception for these two tautomers, the top shows you without that the top uh, and she shows you without that um, hydrogen layer and they are equivalent here and here are equivalent as soon as you define the option to define where the protons are on the on the molecule then you add this layer right here fixed f fixed proton layer and it defines for you where the protons are so and she can define both define tautomers and collapse them uh, stereo, similarly as I did for smiles, here's one stereo form, here's another stereo form, and you can just, just think of it as uh, negative and positive stereo, uh, and, and I will show you how this stereo layer can be used for both structure checking as well as um, structure searching. So this is a, an interesting molecule. Uh, this is strychnine, and uh, the question would be, how would you determine whether or not all the stereo centers on this molecule have been identified and what they are. Now, if you've ever been through trying to figure out stereochemistry on even the simplest molecule, you, you're getting into this twisting of fingers and trying to see which, what rotates in what direction. Today, with software, you, you clearly don't need that. You can check your, your stereochemistry, stereo centers explicitly using a software package. So. If you use ChemDraw or ChemSketch, you click a button and it immediately tells you that these are the stereo centers. So that what you would do with your drawing package. It doesn't mean we don't need to understand stereochemistry. It doesn't mean we shouldn't understand how to uh, look at the ver various groups and figure out what stereochemistry is. But believe me, no, nobody in industry does that. So can anybody see a problem with this molecule as drawn if it's meant to be strychnine? Not easy to spot, but there is a stereo center missing. It's not explicitly defined. It's right here. And you would find that on, on your drawing package also. Uh, this was what ChemSketch would show, the drawing package I, I tend to use because I managed it for so many years. It would tend to identify it as unambiguous. It hasn't been defined, but it recognizes it as a stereo center. Now, what would happen in Inchi if, if there was an undefined stereo center? Uh, here we see the different stereo centers are actually labeled. Remember I said minus or plus, minus or plus. And here we have a question mark showing up saying that in this particular molecule, the stereo center that is not defined, it's not labeled. That becomes very valuable when you're checking uh, data for quality. And I will come back to that. There's also standardization that is required. And INSHI has built in standardization. Here we have nitrobenzene, a very simple organic molecule. Here we have nitrobenzene, a simple organic molecule. This is charge separated, plus minus. That's how a certain group of chemists might draw nitrobenzene. Other chemists or other databases or other software packages might have the nitrogen as pentavalent. And now we have double bond oxygen, double bond oxygen, single bond from the nitrogen. It's not charged. If you look at the smile string for nitrobenzene, you see charge separation here. If you look at the smile string for nitrobenzene, you see it's double bonded to oxygen. So it's pretty easy to actually interpret the smile string. However, we know that these are meant to be the same molecule. They're just drawn, uh, drawn, drawn differently. That's a standardization issue. Different databases and different pharmaceutical companies uh, have chosen different standardization representations. Uh, earlier this week, I just got back up from a two-day meeting at the European Bioinformatics Institute. 60 people in a room, pharmaceutical companies, database providers, public database providers, commercial tool vendors, all trying to come up with ways that we 
can agree to standardize small molecules such that when you're trying to link between these databases, you can do it efficiently. If I linked by smiles, I would miss it. If I tried to merge databases together, for example, when Glaxo acquired SmithKline to form GlaxoSmithKline, they had to do this standardization. They had to choose one approach. The, there are millions and millions of chemicals together. It's very challenging. INSHE has built-in standardization for certain types, and here you can see it doesn't matter whether you have it as charge separated or as pentavalent, you actually have the same INSHE. So it has that built into it. Also highly advantageous. Uh, here's another example. Do you, you know, the, uh, the charge salt, so you've got the chloride anion, and here you've got the hydrochloride. The smiles are distinctly different. The INSHE string is the same here and here. And the INSHE key, which is just a hash of the string, is also the same. I'll tell you a little more about the hash. So for this particular molecule, you take any INSHE string, and why would you want to form a hash? Well, this came up after a visit to Google. People who were developing INSHE visited Google and presented to what they were trying to do. Because basically, Google is the top search engine in the world. Uh, it doesn't mean that you don't use Bing or Yahoo, but Google is certainly the name. People use it as a verb. Um, and what, what uh, was discussed at the Google meeting is that large molecules have extremely long INSHE strings, and they truncate. And if you truncate a, a Google, uh, an INSHE string in Google, then you're clearly not going to be searching the right mo molecule because you've just shrunk it. Uh, there are also other things that go on with Google where it starts to uh, deal with characters in certain ways, and you can end up with some mishits. So the suggestion from that meeting at Google was why not hash it using a well-defined algorithm and hash it into uh, two components. The first component of the string is the connection. It's how the atoms and bonds are put together. So now all tautomers will end up having the same connectivity. Uh, all stereoisomers will end up having the same connectivity. Everything with different isotopes, different charge, will have the same connectivity. So this part, first part of the string will end up being equivalent. And the second part of the string contains isotopes, stereoisomers, uh, stereoisomeric detail, uh, charge, etc. This brings so much power to interlinking the internet for searching, uh, as, you will, as you will see. So, I will tell you more about ChemSpider shortly, but this is a piece of what ChemSpider has brought. We've built a database of uh, over 25 million chemicals, or over 26 million right now. It's linked out to 400 data sources. For each chemical record we have on the database, what we do is we bring it in and we, we manage it as a connection table. So you can see all the stereochemistry, you can see the layout, uh, you can see all the stereo bonds on the sugar moieties. This is labeled as vancomycin. This is supposedly the structure of vancomycin. Whether it is or not is a different question that will come up shortly. But for right now, it's a molecule that you would find when you search vancomycin. Because we have the connection table, we can pass it through a whole series of algorithms. And we can populate the database with properties. For example, systematic names. If I asked you to generate the UPAC name of that chemical, believe me, we can do it faster and more accurately with software than almost anybody in, that, uh, in your room, I'm sure. I don't know how many of you could generate a UPAC name, but it's a fraction of a second with software today. The rules are well defined, it's ideal. Uh, we can predict log P, we can predict log D, we can predict boiling points, we can count number of rotatable bonds. We can do so much of this with, with computer algorithms today, and you, you end up populating a database with a set of properties that you can now search very easily. If I said to you, what's the molecular formula of that? That would take time. What's the monoisotopic mass that a mass spectrometrist would want? That would take time. This is all done. It's all pre-calculated or generated. One of the other things we do is we pass it through a SMILES generator. And as I said, there are numerous. We use one SMILES generator from OpenEye. We also use the INSHI code that is supplied um, by the UPAC project and we plug it in. Every molecule, every connection table hits that INSHI code and generates an INSHI string and an INSHI key. 
today's inchy strings are generated as what they call standard inches, standard inchy strings, and that is a predefined set of options that all database providers uh, can use. Once they click the check box that says generate standard inchy key, all of us are generating the same keys. This enables us all to connect together. So this is the standard inchy key. Remember that this is the the um, core structure, the connectivity, and this is the um, isotope layer and the charge, etc. Once we have vancomycin sitting on ChemSpider, then we have this ability. And I will show this live in the demo later um, for, for molecules you might be interested in. If you click on the first part of the string, what it does is it simply passes that part of the string out to Google and searches the molecular skeleton. If you click on the second part of the inchy key, then it passes the entire length of the string out and searches the full molecule. One button click and it uses the Google search engine. I'll come back and show you the successes in a moment because there are some questions. For now, let me, let me go to another molecule called vincristine. I don't know how many of you heard vincristine, but if you want, to, if I said to you, find me information on vincristine, you'd probably do the following. You do a name search on Google. You might go to Wikipedia to find out more about it. You might go to Wolfram Alpha. You might do name searching, name searching, name searching, name searching to try and figure out what vincristine is because you can't molecularly search it because you don't know what it is yet. So you can, you will do name searching in various places and you will get back a representation. However, you, you can also structure search dozens of websites, structure search them once you've figured out the molecule. What would it be like if all of the name searching and all of the Wikipedia uh, articles and what's on Wolfram Alpha and all of the other databases that you are finding information on and all of the dozens of, data, of websites that contain structural information, what if it could all be searched from one single website based on name or structure. What would that enable you to do? That's what we tried to do. That's what we've been working on and what originally started as a hobby project, myself and a couple of friends, three servers, two hand-built, one purchased. And by hand-built, I mean plugging chips into boards and buying the cases and shoving in the hard drives, plugging it into Time Warner cable, running out of a basement and taking thousands, then tens of thousands, then hundreds of thousands of hits in a day for people searching chemistry data. The result of it was ChemSpider. This is a free website. It's free to everybody. There are no charges for anybody to use it. There are no charges for you to take data from it and use it. You can deposit to it. You can participate in curating it. Um, we have services available that people can link their own software to, and that's happened. We've got dozens and dozens of people linking their software to it now. This is what ChemSpider looks like. The simple search would be type in the chemical name, the structure search would be, if you know the structure, then you can search that structure by pasting in a mole file or pasting in a smile string or an inchy string or an inchy key or uploading a chem draw file, things like that. And we also have a whole series of advanced searches such as find me all molecules out of the 26 million that have this substructure, molecular weight between 230 and 234, and I know it's got two phenyl groups and an isopropyl group from my mass spec fragmentation. You can do that type of search. So I want to know about vincristine. I don't know how many of you would know that structure, but that is the structure known as vincristine, according to ChemSpider. Uh, this is part of what you would see. We see nine out of nine defined stereo centers. We have, we have the ability to see the 2D spec, uh, structure. We can show you a 3D one, which is optimized and rotated in, in space. You can save that to your desktop so you don't have to draw it again. You just plug it into your drawing package, ChemDraw, ChemSketch. We pass it to you as a mole file. Here's the ChemSpider ID. So if you ever wanted to refer back to it, it's chemspider.com slash 57758. That ID will never change. The molecule behind it will never change. Information may be layered onto it later, so more information will find its way to the record. But that ID is that structure. It will not change. The molecular formula is derived directly from the mole file. 
the monoisotopic mass is generated by summing up the number of elements and their masses. The systematic name is generated by software. Under here we have smiles and inches. Uh, we can embed this structure just like a YouTube video. If you wanted to write a blog post and rather than draw this molecule or create an image, you wanted to link it to ChemSpider, you would simply embed the code, copy paste. You can delete the record if you think it's wrong and it will flag it as deprecated. Somebody will come behind you, will check it, will send you an email on your comments and we will either return it or we can deprecate it. For most people, deprecate is not available. It's only available there for people who've asked to be curators. And of course, you can watch the record, the molecule of interest, and you want to see what new shows up. Click on watch this record, and you will get emails telling you new publication, new spectrum has been attached, et cetera, et cetera. This is only a part of the record. If you go scroll down, you actually see names and synonyms. So this is a short list of all of the names that have been identified for this structure. These are bolded because they're actually validated by experts. People have come along and said, this is the correct INEX number, European identifier. This is the correct registry number. Uh, these are correct synonyms. Here's the name of Vincristine, and it's linked here to Wikipedia. One click and you're sitting on Wikipedia. This is the Latin name. And below it, there could be two more names. There could be a hundred. There are over 400 synonyms for aspirin. Trade names, um, multilingual names, multiple identifiers. All of them come in unvalidated. So they, be, they come into the system as non-validated names. Then people come and they validate them. They say, this is correct. And then when anybody validates data on ChemSpider, we have master curators who come behind them and they check whatever what the public is saying. We also have here experimental data. So here's the melting point and if you click on this arrow here you will go out to the website that says that's the melting point. Gives you appearance, stability, toxicity, safety information and if you want predicted properties you can either predict with ACD labs and those are already pre-generated sitting on the database. So that would be boiling point, log P, log D, or two, two pHs for physiological profiling, et cetera, et cetera. And if you want predicted, then you can go here and it will send it off site and predict them on somebody else's site. But they always get the latest and greatest algorithms there. If you want to know where to buy it, because chemical vendors are giving us their data sets to deposit against ChemSpider, then you can source Vincristine as represented on our database by these three data sources. Here are their catalog IDs. You click on, on any of these links, it takes you to their website. You can go through their ordering system, et cetera, et cetera. ChemSpider doesn't have any deals with these people. We don't make money. We don't share in their revenue. It's just a data source that links in. We have, for each of the chemicals, when data comes in, we have different types of data. So we have safety data, we have metabolism data, we have physical properties that have been measured, tox data. And in this case, I'm, I'm looking at the biological data tab. We have all of these uh, links alive. So you can go and look at the LeadScope site and find out what LeadScope has about biological data about vincristine. You can go to ChemBank or DiscoveryGate or the National Institute, uh, the AIDS investigation, Drug Bank. All of these link out and you can go check out the records there. What we are not doing is we are not taking everybody's data from 400 data sources that is changing every day, updated and deprecated and curated and edited. And we're not trying to bring it all together on a daily basis to try and mesh it. What we do is we take the structure, we take the, the, the identifiers they have, and we give you the links out to their database so that they manage their data locally and we just get you to it. We also take you to patents. So this is Google Patents. Google Patents is not searchable by structure. You cannot go onto Google and, and draw the structure of Vincristine and say, find me all patents. But what you can do, of course, is search on the, the name Vincristine. However, Vincristine has multiple names, as I showed you. All of these names are valid. 
Let me go back here. All of these names are valid. So if it happens to be called 22-oxo-vincolucoblastine in the patent, you will not find that patent if you search by vincristine only because it's a text search. However, since we have this long list now of validated synonyms and identifiers, we can pass them all out simultaneously to Google Patents and search them all. So here we've done a search and it's give, given us Vin Christine containing product. It's a link. You click on it. It opens the patent on Google Patents. Same here. Method of preparing Vin Christine. Process for the preparation. Method of preparing. So these are different um, patents, all sitting on Google Patents, all linked up. In the first five, uh, every one of them contains the term Vin Christine. But as you scroll down the collection, you will find that the other names are being shown because uh, they didn't find them by Vin Christine. So what we've done is by collapsing a series of names against the structure is we've enabled you to tap into application programming interfaces such as Google, not only Google Patents, but Google Scholar, and find all of the molecules matched by name. Here we have US uh, PTO, European granted applic applications, Japanese. These are from a collaborator called Shurchem, now owned by Macmillan. And SureCam allow you to do structure-based searching of patent databases. When you click on this, it will give you the name of the patent and a link, and it takes you through to their site and shows you the patent. In the same way, we can link to articles. So here we have a link, a list of articles that was added that's available on PubMed. And what we've done is Vin, the term Vincristine is is being detected in either the uh, title or the abstract of the article and this is done on the fly so if you come back a week from now and ask the question again and there's a new article about Vin Christine it will sh it will be linked up not because we're actively going through and linking we're just using the search of the validated names against the PubMed API to do to do the search we're also linking up RSC books so ChemSpider it belongs to the Royal Society of Chemistry so we've met matched all of our own content RSC journals, Google Books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So anything that has an API that we can search based on chemical name, we can return the data here if they if they will allow it. Let's go back now to what I was telling you about with structures. Here we have vancomycin. We know that you can go search the databases and the online resources by name, as I've shown you by for uh, in Christine. And we, we can search it by structure, and they're all separated. And there's no easy way to find all of those databases other than to actively link them to ChemSpider. But since Google uh, is indexing all of the databases that are out there, even those that are not yet linked to ChemSpider, we can search them. So if I search the molecular skeleton, I find within a, within a fraction of a second on Google, I find 104 hits for that structure connectivity table. Remember, it's only the skeleton. It's not the stereochemistry. It's not the isotopes. It's not the charge. Just the skeleton. And here it is. We've got vancomycin on, on Kebi, which is the EBI, vancomycin on drug bank, vancomycin on pubchem, vancomycin on chemical register, which is a Chinese vendor, I believe, ligand depot, vancomycin. And if you look at the, this string here, that's what I've searched. And it's, it's the same on every database. Unfortunately, this part is not the same. This is different than this, is different than this, is different than this, which means that these molecules that people have called vancomycin and have drawn as vancomycin are different in the stereo layer or in the charge layer or in the isotope layer. They're calling them vancomycin. The connectivity is, the, is identical. That's why we're finding them. But the stereochemistry and charge in an isotope layer is, is different. So uh, I'll let you take your own estimate in, the, in your head because it's hard to interact with an audience uh, so far away. But if you were to search on the actual full molecule, the question is from 104, so, so now the entire Inchi key, by clicking on the second part, from the entire 104, how many would match, actually match the structure of vancomycin from that 104? How many would have a full match on this string? So I'll let you take your own guess and then tell you that when I did the search a couple of months ago, it was four. 
So 100 structures called vancomycin sitting on databases hosted in the public domain by various organizations. Of those 104, only 104 were correct. And one of them actually happens to be the same, it's ChemSpider. Now, when I originally did this, of course I was running into possibilities that people had actually me meant to synthesize a stereoisomer of vancomycin, so they switched one stereocenter. It's possible that people will radioisotope label one site on the compound in order to do a particular bioassay. So it makes sense that the second part of the Lynchy key would be different. However, close investigation shows that in most cases it was, they were all supposed to be vancomycin, give or take 5%. They were all meant to be vancomycin. They were all represented as vancomycin. They were missing stereochemistry or had inverted stereochemistry. So the question, how do we know on, on ChemSpider that this is the correct vancomycin string? If you want to see the story, I recommend that you go to vancomycin on ChemSpider and look at the, the story about how we validated the structure. We worked closely with somebody from the environmental, uh, excuse me, from the European Bioinformatics Institute. It took three days. We referenced publications. We tell you why we think it's vancomycin. And since then, some of the other public databases have gone back and edited their compounds because they said, yes, we agree. Um, that's what they call crowdsourcing, working with other people to validate the data for the benefit of the community. So now if you search vancomycin, you'll find the one hit. So this issue of quality on the internet, that's what this represents. Do we trust everything on the web? Uh, clearly, we should. Everything that is said on the web is good. Everything about cats flying through the air on YouTube is, is just stunningly wonderful. Um, but here's, so here's an example. Uh, if you go search apoptic, apoptotic gene therapy in an interdigital web, you will, you will come up with an article uh, on cell death and differentiation. A letter to the editor. It shows you this particular image. Uh, this is the interdigital web right here. And it is a recreation of the interdigital web after WSD gene gun in a number professional swimmer. His name happens to be, oh my god, I swim fast. Now that seems rather strange to have a non-professional swimmer suddenly called, oh my god, I swim fast. Um, but you never know. Accidents can happen. Don't forget this is in cell death and differentiation. Uh, then you read it and you think, you see things like, we established a collaboration with Professor something Wang. Hmm, might be something wrong. Uh, a fugitive from who you hiding, uh, which of course is where fugitives will go hide. They, people will ask, who you hiding? And then the new protein, why so dim? Well, if you believe what was written in this article, then you would have to be pretty dim. Uh, I've actually spoken to the editors, uh, numerous editors at Nature, where this article is housed, and they don't. They tell me they don't know about this. It wasn't an April Fool's joke that they're aware of but it sits out there registered in PubMed and findable. So, of course, what's said on the web is true. Um, if we could all contribute chemistry to the web, if it was not just about me, so if I, if I wasn't the only one who thought that my answers were important and everything I do was important and I should keep it to myself, uh, if that's how the world worked, then you know maybe we'd end up by me contributing. So we might have a community built encyclopedia I might know where the best restaurants are. I might get good advice on books to read. I might know which movies to watch. I know, might know which plumber to call and data might be open. I might contribute some. And of course, that is the world of today. Uh, we have a community built encyclopedia and it's brilliant. And I judge every one of you use it, but might not fully trust it yet. Which begs the question, why did you trust Britannica? Um, I might know where the best restaurants are because some of us use Foursquare and we help each other find good places to eat and get bargains and people write book reviews, people write Netflix reviews. This is the world of today. People are contributing all the time. The question is, will that and can that happen in chemistry? So as I said, ChemSpider is a host for community contributions. Most of the databases out there are not. If you find errors, it's very hard to report them. 
You send an email, you don't get a response. Not, not all of them, but many of them. Um, there, there are no simple ways to curate, edit, annotate, and comment on the majority of databases. In fact, um, while I was in Britain, I showed the EBI the chemical terminal dimethyl. Terminal dimethyl. And if you go search terminal dimethyl and you, ch you check on drug bank, you see two methane molecules. Um, if you search on, and there should be no, it should be methane, it shouldn't be two methane molecules. Um, if you search on Wolfram Alpha on terminal dimethyl, you see two methane molecules. You search on PubChem, two methane molecules. They're all incorrect. They all refer to something called methane, which we all know about from cows and global warming. Um, and that's what should be there. I left a comment on drug bank and it has still not shown up after four days. I have no ability to leave a comment on PubChem, which is 30 million chemicals hosted by NIH. And when I, and I submitted to Wolfram Alpha and the last five, six reports I put on Wolfram Alpha resulted in no changes in two and a half years. So even if we do as a community try and help these things improve, there are problems. Many, many are non-responsive. ChemSpider is different. You come, you leave, if you choose only to leave a comment, you're generally going to get a response if it's within uh, working hours for the Western world and RSC is housed in Cambridge and I'm in North Carolina. So you're going to get feedback generally within, I'd say, five or six hours. Uh, you will certainly get feedback overnight, um, except for maybe if it's the weekend. Uh, we will tell you whether we agree with your comments. If we don't agree with your comments, you'll get a detailed e email explaining why. But we go one step further than, than that. If you choose to become a curator, you can log in, you can say, I want to be a curator. You can come. You can remove chemical names. You can make annotations. You can submit your spectra online. And believe me, when your spectra go online, they will also get validated because we feed them out to students in a game and when the students play the game to interpret NMR spectra, they will catch bad data and it will be deleted from the database as a part of playing a game called spectralgame.com. You can submit images, you can submit movies, you can submit entire stories about how to synthesize a molecule and it's all immediate. When you publish it, it goes live immediately. Uh, have we been vandalized? Yes. My recollection is maybe three times ever in four years. We've had people uh, accidentally remove a name that happened to be correct, but when we've challenged them and argued with them about why we think it's correct, in general, we can get to a good agreement. Um, we've had somebody submit a photograph of a mouse under, under, under a, an explosive, only for them to explain that he worked for the army and he was testing the system and he replaced the explosive mouse with an, with an infrared spectrum within an hour. Uh, and we've had somebody try to sell their house <laughs> on, uh, on ChemSpider. I don't think it's sold. But this is a live system. So you contribute and it's live and immediate. You can become a data source. You can put your photograph up there, all of your details, what your research is, and you can house your own data source on ChemSpider live for the community. Uh, if sites allow direct feedback, my request to you as users of the web is please leave it. If you happen to go off and use ChemSpider and say this molecule is ugly, please tell me it's ugly. Tell, tell my colleagues it's ugly. Don't just walk away saying ChemSpider's got ugly molecules. Because when you leave the comment, we will deal with it. Um, and curating existing data, we have active projects going uh, with people that Bob knows, like Jean-Claude Bradley, where we're curating melting point data. Um, as a result of curating melting point data derived from multiple public databases, today we have the best melting point prediction algorithms in the world. They are fully open, fully available to anybody to use, anybody to contribute to, anybody can add more data in. And it's only by working together and collaborating that we're managing to improve those, those data. Uh, this is an example of a spectrum that was uploaded. Uh, this is cholesterol. It's a C13 spectrum. I can show you on ChemSpider directly, but I can, I can zoom in on this. I can vertically scale it. Uh, I can download the data. So if any of you use, need spectra for your classes, proton, carbon, 2D spectra, um, infrared, Raman, 
IR, mass spec, electron impact, please visit ChemSpider. Um, there are over, I think it's two and a half thousand spectra now. The majority of them are marked by the by the contributors as open data. That means that it's fully open. You can take it. You can do what you want with it. You can even commercialize the collection if you choose to. I don't think the community would appreciate it, but you can. There are no license boundaries to open data. So all of these data are there for you to use. And as I said, we feed this out to a game. Um, we also have another project running in parallel called ChemSpider Synthetic Pages. Uh, ChemSpider Synthetic Pages is for reaction. It is community developed. So we've developed all the code, we've set up the database, we've set up all the templates and we house it. But we don't actually uh, submit any articles at all. No syntheses come from the RSC. What we've done is we've said, please come along and if you have reactions of interest that you wish to share with the with the community, please submit them. Um, it was originally, the original data set was from f uh, three academics in London called Peter Scott, Kevin Buck and Mulburn and uh, Stephen Caddick. Uh, they set up a database online and they merged with us, with ChemSpider, so that we could do some, some pretty things with, with what they'd been doing. So um, when you, sw you click a switch in the, in the article, every chemical is highlighted in the article directly. You can hover over it and it shows you the molecule as a pop-up box. You can click, it goes into ChemSpider. We host the spectra associated with the reactions. All of the, re the reactions themselves are downloadable. You can download all the molecules. And again, this, the, these data are there for you to use. We especially encourage students because when we take these submissions from students, it teaches them how to write up an article. It teaches them how to deal with electronic systems. And we do give them a DOI, a digital object identifier that they can put on their CV. This is essentially an electronic journal focused on reactions. It's called ChemSpider Synthetic Pages, and it's at cssp.chemspider.com. Very simple template based. Every article submitted is reviewed by the, by the editorial board. That is four um, organic chemists, excuse me, four synthetic chemists um, with, a, with a bias to organic, but um, Peter works on organometallics. Um, occasionally they will be accepted immediately and just published as is. Most often there are some require requests such as, you know, could you please define the yield? Um, could you, we, we, we're a little suspicious about the temperature only to find out that somebody's left, left a zero off the end of their, uh, of their, a refluxing temperature or something. Um, so we give an iterative feedback. It improves the quality of the article. It's generally live within within a day. Some take take a few weeks to interact, and it ends up making a much better article for everybody, the author as well as the community. Online, on, once it's published, it's fully online peer review too. So people come back and they say, "I've tried your reaction. I changed the solvent. I improved the yield by forty percent." And here you go. And, and their detail then can get, get attached as a comment, and we encourage them to then submit their own article. There's no reason not to have um, multiple articles about the same chemical. So what I've been trying to show you is, is the diverse types of chemistry that are available. There is so much chemistry uh, online, it's, it's quite shocking how fast it's changing. Um, of course, it's not just chemistry, it's also you know, biochemistry and physics, and there's lots of uh, chem informatics projects you should be aware of, lots of bioinformatics projects. I would say bioinformatics is, is far ahead of chem informatics. It's been incredibly well funded over the years. Systems there are, are rugged and well tested and, and superb, and chem informatics is catching up, um, but is doing it on a shoestring because the, most of the funding agencies don't worry as much about chem informatics. At the end of the day, I would say if you look at uh, small molecules contribution to the environment, to our health, uh, to how we're made up and what we generate as metabolites. There's a lot of small molecules we should concern ourselves with, of course. A searching of the internet is possible. You're already doing it on text. Uh, um, clearly, you're searching Google for, for chemicals by text uh, regularly, I should think. But of course, you can now structure search. You could come to ChemSpider. You can draw in a chemical structure or draw it in your ChemDraw package and upload it paste it in as a smiles, whatever. 
Once it's in ChemSpider, you click, the, you click search, it will find that chemical on ChemSpider. Now you have from ChemSpider the links to Google patents, real patents uh, in Japan and Europe. Google patents are also real, of course. So you've got all those. You've got Google Scholar. You've got all of the books on Google. You've got RSC articles. You've got PubMed. You've got physical chemical properties. You can generate physical chemical properties. You have Spectra and on and on and on. There's so much more that I haven't had time to tell you about. I've probably told you about 15% of the capabilities. The INSHI I hope I've shown is very powerful and has linked the internet and will only continue to improve. It doesn't yet support polymers, organometallics uh, are challenging, inorganics are challenging. All are being worked on. All will be solved within the next couple of years, is making linking of the internet even more powerful for chemistry. Quality on the internet is diverse. Just because you find a hit to a to a structure based uh, to a name based search for structure doesn't make anything right. Uh, Wikipedia is excellent. Many of the databases out there are excellent, and I'm presently running a wiki just as a hobby called SciDBs S C I D B S dot org dot com SciDBs dot com, where we are. Uh, critiquing all the various databases, we're uh, bringing them all together so people can come and look what's out there. We're also going to put some quality metrics on it as we check the data. And I would encourage all of you to contribute to the chemistry internet. It is there for you to use. There's no mandate for you to contribute. There's no obligations. But if you all did one thing a day in terms of improving the quality of data, everybody sitting around you might get the benefit. And that you know that's community. Uh, I hope you've heard me. Um, I hope it's it's uh, been able to show you what what we've been up to for a few years and how to use the internet for chemistry. Uh, if you need to contact me and have any questions, this is my email address. All of these slides will go to my SlideShare SlideShare account right here, uh, and you can follow me on Twitter if you care. And I have a blog here that talks about various aspects. And I think I'm about on time, Bob. And uh, over to you. Okay, well, let's thank uh, Dr. Williams.